man, we just finished a, a, an episode with Tom Askman, who uh, he is a professor at Eastern Washington University, he teaches art, painting. Um, he's also my neighbor. <laughs> and uh, I lived right across the street from Tom for a, close to a year. And then he graciously had me and Taz over for dinner, and I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I've been missing out. This guy is such a joyful, kind, considerate, collected human being to be around. And uh, this episode was great. I mean, I there was – I could talk for another three hours with the guy. I don't know uh, how you right, guys – Right, right, right. Yeah, he's – Easily. He, yeah, and we should, honestly – He's, we again. You said it on the podcast that he didn't even get into his art. We just talked about being a human and, yeah. and finding your presence and being, you know, still being a and, being. and being a being. And ah, man, it's like I walk away from some of these podcasts all the time, feeling grateful that we're doing something like this and being like, ah, oh, man, this is cool. We're doing a we're doing a cool thing. Mm. How good is this? Rip it and grip it, rip it and grip it. Rip it and grip it, rip it and grip it. Well, take me there with the tune, guys. What do you want to sing to Tom? We usually like to start off with singing a song, Tom. Uh, Tom, what's your favorite band? Well, I'll sing a song for you. (laughs) Hell yeah. It's a song that I I stole the, uh, not the lyrics, but the tune from Mr. Sandman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring me a treat. Because I happen to be a (laughs) spamaholic. I love spam. You ever like Masu- you ever Masubi? Masubi? I don't know Masubi. Oh. Is she a Japanese? It's like a Hawaiian dish where they take square rice, slab of spam, sp- spam, yeah. and wrap it in seaweed. Yeah, spam's got a bad rap. I agree. I like spam. Really? People, people believe that spam is made out of all the you know toenails and all the gristle <laughs> and stuff. That's that's not right. Spam is SP means spiced. A.M. is ham. It's spiced ham. It's all made out of pork shoulder, nothing else. Huh. So let's get this straight. Let's okay. do it right here yeah, on yeah, the How right Gives This right Podcast here. with Tom you Askman. non-spam eaters, just take note. <laughs> so because I'm a spam addict, I uh, decided to write a little song. I did a video on this, too, called yeah. Mr. Yes. Spam Man. <laughs> okay. And the song goes like this. <clears throat> Bom 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 Mr. Spam Man, I'm so alone I don't have a spam can to call my own That special pink meat with jelly all over I want to handle it and smell that odor, Mr. Spam Man. And it goes on and on. That's, that's the beginning. Dude, that's a good one. Yeah. Tom Aspen, what a guy, dude. Never, be- never before Spam has a guest man. brought his own song for us. That is <laughs> pretty treat. special. What a treat you are, Tom Aspen. <laughs> Uh, we are joined in the studio today by uh, a legend of a human being and actually my neighbor, Mr. Tom Askman. Pleasure to have you, brother. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me out here. This is a, a very wonderful opportunity of doing something I have not ever tasted before. Yeah, well, I'm excited to to taste a little rendition of your spam later because yeah. now you you've opened up the <laughs> Pandora's box. Because we will, I've got I've got a couple spam tricks up my sleeve as well. I don't I'm gonna know how over. much spam I've had. I don't know if I really care for spam too much. It's spiced but, ham. Well, uh, let's. So, do you know the history of spam at all, Tom? Yes, I do, and I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> yeah. Back during WW2, the big war. Yep. When they started sending, you know, millions of men overseas, they were sending round cans of uh, potted meat, but they, some smart guy realized that if you change the shape to a rectangle, you can put them together end to end and you get more cans in a box than you do with circles mm. because there's space between each one of the circles. Oh. So then they created the, the boxy shape of a spam can so mm-hmm. they could send all these over there and that's the beginning of that, of that shape. And also, they only made one car during World War II called a Crosley. 
Mm -hmm. And a Crosley was a very small car that was very boxy. And they could put two of them side by side and stack them in railroad cars. Mm. With the old fashioned cars, you couldn't do that. So they were able to, they made one car only during World War II. Wow, I didn't know no that. Way. Same shape as a spam can. <laughs> Just yeah. a big spam can is all they were. I'm, with I, wheels. I, wow. uh, was it always spiced ham? Yes. Or was there some other. No, no, no. They're pu this is pure. This is uh, something that they've always, you know, uh, held in high regard and they've never dropped below their, uh, you know, the, what do you call that, their principle. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. you're right. In, I think before we pressed record, you were, uh, you were on a tyrant of uh, your disgust for the marketing campaign of spam because it's gotten a bad, bad rap in our country. You weren't disgusted. I'm just I'm making that up for, no. <laughs> for context. Uh, although... Um, a lot of people in Hawaii eat spam. Yes, they do. There's a lot of there's a lot of spam in Hawaii, and I was mentioning to you masubi. You never have. I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring some masubi. Taz makes some really good masubi. Actually, there's egg on it too. That's another thing I forgot. Mm -hmm. You know, like the sushi um, rolls that have rice and then uh, just a little bit of like scrambled egg on top. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, that with with spam. In between the egg and the rice, ooh, delight! Absolutely. I'm gonna have to let you guys make that for me. Yeah, dude, I'm Absolutely. I'm pretty pumped about bringing that one over to Tom's house. I'm gonna surprise you. So you might you might ask the question, why do so many Hawaiians like spam? Because Hawaii was on the way overseas to Japan, and all of our troops were stationed in Hawaii. Well, lots and lots of them. So they delivered tons of spam to Hawaii, and the Hawaiians took it up. I mm. mean, they just like. They fell in love with it. That's why so many wow. Hawaiians eat spam to this day. Interesting. So blame it on World War II. Let's go back. You just said our troops. Were you uh, were you part of those troops as well? No, I was one generation later. I was in. Uh, well, I I was forced to join the service during Vietnam. Okay. You were. But I didn't go on the uh, you know the branch where you had to go overseas and kill people. I couldn't have done that. I was able to get into the uh, Air National Guard and avoided uh, anything that I couldn't have killed people. I couldn't have uh -huh. done any of that stuff. And I was also terrified of the idea of yeah. being sent off to that kind of stuff. So I was able to get into the Air National Guard. Um, and then I had a job in the Air National Guard that saved us Americans from foreign aggressors because they taught me how to hand out the right grid of sandpaper to the mechanics who were working on jet engines at an airfield in Wyoming. We had a Air Force airfield there. And so if I would have handed out the wrong grit to a mechanic, it would have caused these giant bombers to crash. And huh. that would have allowed, you know, Russian bombers to come across. So you can thank me for <laughs> yeah, saving you. you from, you know, <laughs> hey, Tom, thank being you. bombed. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Thank what you, was Tom. the grit? Do you You're remember? Welcome. Well, you, you know, it goes from uh, 20 grit all the way up to 3,000. Right. And, and 3,000 is like the finer polishing, that's right? That's super, super. You can't even hardly feel right. anything on it. Yeah, that's for that's for polishing the final things on the jet engines. Mm. But if you give them 20 grit, it's, you know, it's a disaster. But do you remember what the specific perfect grit of sandpaper was for the jets, or did they take all of them? They take them all. It's based on, see, that you know, the rougher grits take off the metal faster, so they work from, you know, rougher to smoother, but once in a while, you know, they aren't paying attention, and I slip them a piece of sandpaper that's... Well, you can see what would happen. It's, oh, yeah. You know, wouldn't mm -hmm. have been pretty. Yeah, you saw. You see what happened to my face. Yeah. I had used the wrong grit the other day while I was <laughs> in the bathroom, and there it is. <laughs> shit all disappeared. <laughs> Bugger, how, man. How, how old were you back then during those times? Uh, I went in... Uh, let's see, I was just finished art school out in California, and I would have been 23. 3, 22, something like that. Voluntarily probably. went in or were drafted? Oh, no, no. I See, I would have been drafted in the military. In fact, uh, well, well, we'll back up just a little bit. The last okay. semester I was in art school, I was in the Bay Area at a, at a private art school, not a regular college. And um, I had written a letter back to the draft board in Wyoming, where I'm from, and I just had this impulse to write them and tell them how how much I disagreed with the whole war and how I didn't want to go do something uh, like kill people in a foreign country. I would rather go teach art and help people 
learn how to be more creative. Mm -hmm. And I sent a letter to the draft board. Now, why I did that now, I look back and wonder what the hell was wrong with me. But um, I didn't. <laughs> no, I, they just had wrote, address. I wrote the letter, sent yeah, it off, exactly. forgot about it. And then about a week after I sent the letter off, I get a, a call from a college down in Missouri. It was a private women's college outside of Kansas City. And I had applied uh, for grad school because this is just after my undergrad during my uh, undergrad degree. I had applied to grad school at a college, University of uh, Missouri, and the wife of the guy who was in charge of that art program had sent my slides over to her school, which where she was teaching. They were looking for an art person to come down and teach at that private women's college, and they, they loved my art, and she called and said, hey, we want to offer you a job. Come down here and teach at Stevens Women's College. Mm. I got offered a job, but I'd sent that letter back to the draft board the week before, and then a week after that, I get a call from my father saying, Tommy, what the hell did you do? <laughs> he said, I'm good friends with the so-and-so, the draft board guy, and he had taken your name off the list. You would have never been oh, no. Drafted. Oh, no. Oh, no. And now you are at the top of the list. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. You were the original <laughs> hater. So I would have been, uh, my life would have been probably destroyed had I got taken that job down oh. at a women's college at my age back in the day when I was still doing a lot of running and gunning and drinking. And so it probably worked out for the best. Mm. You said your life would have been destroyed had it not have gone this, that way. If it had gone that way, because I think I would have gotten into too much trouble. Mm. How so? If he had gone to the women's college. Women's college. Together. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> he's yeah. a, and you were running you were running and gunning pretty heavily. He's a man. Yeah, he's yeah. a man going to a women's college. Yeah, Bunch of women. Yeah. Like would, and you and were he's what, handsome and dapper AF. Yeah. You were in your mid-20s or so? Early 20s, yeah. Early 20s, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause for trouble for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. For sure. But on the bright side, you got a whole bunch of free spam. <laughs> that is so true. And how'd I not, uh, had all of that not happened the way it did, I wouldn't be sitting here with you all. That's right. That's it's true. so weird how everything that happens takes you to another place, to another location. And wow, had I not gone in the Air National Guard, I wouldn't have been able to be free to go to graduate school after that, which I did, after I did my f basic training. And everything leads to this moment sitting here with you guys. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So bizarre. It's super cool. It is super wild. I was thinking, uh, I, I think about that quite often. Um, the house that, you know, we live right across the street from you, Tom. I, I may have never met you. The house that we bought uh, was under contract three separate times before we put an offer on it. And in those three separate contracts, they couldn't get an electrician out in time to fix the... What's the box, the big box, you know, where everything goes to, all the electricity? Breaker. The breaker box. There was no electrician with available time to come replace it in time for those contracts with the bank to, you know, to, to, be, to work all right. The fourth one, and the electrician came in that little tiny window, and we got the house. But what, it, it's bonkers how the little deviations in life, the little web that we create is how fragile it is. Yep. I mean, we, I kind of, I kind of live my life in this jovial sense of like, well, nothing, you know, kind of, I'm not a nihilist, but there's definitely moments in my life where I'm like, that doesn't matter. Or that thing, that, I'm, that doesn't matter that I don't go to that party or that I don't do that thing. Or, and uh, those moments could change the entire trajectory of your life. They do. They do, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is really terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. You started uh, uh, doing art really, really young, yeah, Tom? Because mm -hmm. you're like a, a, an award-winning artist and have been, have been a, a professor and have been doing visual art for how long? Well, at least 70 years. 70 years. That's amazing. <laughs> Can't even compute that. Oh, you will. Someday you'll look back. We'll see if I, mm -hmm. if, if I can. Yeah. <laughs> stay on that Peloton, Jules. Yeah, stay on that Peloton. What, um, <laughs> what is it like teaching right now? Well, when the pandemic hit, they 
they wanted all of our well i was down on a sabbatical in new orleans when the when the pandemic hit mm -hmm. and when i came back uh toward the end of March, we, we were on a quarter system. So the spring quarter at Eastern Washington University where I uh, teach uh, was uh, on a quarter system. So they were gonna start April 1st and I was driving back toward in late March, just when the pandemic hit, the freeways were completely barren of cars because everything was locked down. Mm. So a trip that usually takes five and a half days, I made in three from New Orleans back to Spokane. Wow. So I'm gonna tell you this story and then jump into what the question was, if Sweet. I remember. Please, yeah, I'll, I'll remind you. So I took two days to get back to Wyoming, my my kind of hometown, and I was there with uh, my relatives for a couple of days, and then, and then uh, I got the call that there wasn't gonna be any on-campus teaching, and I had to prepare to teach everything online, which I had never done, and I, didn't believe in it then, nor do I believe in it now. So I thought, geez, I got to get back. To, I only got about five days to learn how to Zoom and do all these kind of things and prepare three classes. So the day that I left Wyoming, it, it's a 14-hour drive typically to get back to Spokane from Casper. And uh, I made it in nine hours, which means I was going a little bit faster than the speed <laughs> limit. Yes. Uh, and coincidentally, somewhere in the middle of Montana, where there was no cars hardly at all, I noticed a white car going the other direction, and I thought, well, it can't be a highway patrolman because they always have black cars. Well, it, I, there was a median between us of about 40 feet, and I, I, I looked in my rearview mirror just as the white car went the other way, and then I saw the brake slam on, and I saw the car try to turn around in the median, and I'm about to hit a corner, so I just thought, oh, I know it's a cop. So I went around the corner, and, and I had three choices to make. One was to just slow way down and wait for him. The second was speed up and find a turnout where I could hide and hopefully he would drive by and I'd miss him. <laughs> or the third one was to make up a story. Yeah. So I decided to go with the third one. Great one. And I knew I had about five minutes to figure out the story. Well, it, it came down to, oh yeah, we have this thing called the Toyota Corolla virus or whatever it was called. <laughs> and. I just said, okay, I'm going to just tell them uh, a story. So I got my uh, driver's license out, and I slowed down, and he came up behind me, and I pulled over. And as he got out of the car, I had my driver's license out. I had the window rolled down, and I looked back at him as he got to the back of my car. And I said, excuse me, sir, here's my driver's license. You may not want to get any closer because I may have this thing. <laughs> and I'm heading back to Wyoming in case I need to go to the hospital. And he backed up. <laughs> Come on. And, and he said, he said, God damn it. He said, well, at least slow down so you don't kill yourself on your way back to the hospital. And he let me go. Oh, wow. And he nice. said, by the way, I clocked you at 102. <laughs> Wow, Tom, you are <laughs> such a savage. <laughs> so then I get back to Spokane, and then I have to prepare everything to teach online and so i taught spring quarter of last year all online and it was one of the most challenging experiences i've had i got so frustrated trying to learn technology that i mm. didn't didn't know anything about nor did i want to know about it so then come the fall of this year uh, they said you could put in a request to teach on campus but you had to have all these qualifications. There was about 20 different things. You had to have the typical social distancing and air conditioning and, you know, and I thought, what, what do we have to wear hazmat suits and what's it gonna be? Mm -hmm. Well, I, so I sent in a request with all the things that they asked for and they denied it. So I, they said, you can alter this and try again. So I did and they d denied the second one. Well, it went through three people who who said yes you could teach on campus but then the the safety people were the ones that said no so then i i kind of wrote a letter i didn't kind of i wrote a letter sort of telling them that you know these students are not going to get what they pay for if you don't let me go in and teach painting in person you can't teach painting online you can't you have to be there you have to see the canvases you have to talk to the students individually 
and you have to see the surfaces. They have to be around physical objects, mm -hmm. and you have to have those continuing dialogues going on. And if you don't allow me to teach on campus, I'm going to file a civil <coughs> action suit against the university on their behalf and demand that you pay, their, pay back their tuition. <laughs> and they said, oh, maybe you ought to teach on campus. <laughs> <laughs> So I did. So I've been teaching painting on campus. There seems to be a recurring, uh, a recurring adjective that pops into my mind when I hear you tell these stories about getting, getting off your speeding ticket going 102. You're pretty crafty, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just the, the nature of, you know, when you live more in your right hemisphere and you're more in the creative part of of the brain, then you are able to access all of these potential options quicker than someone who is living more in the rational brain all the time. Mm -hmm. mm. You, you always been that way? Yeah. Yeah, ever since you were a kid? Yeah. You started painting when you were young? Uh, just drawing. Just when drawing. I was a kid, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And carving things. I did a lot of, you know, carving wood and making little sculptures and things when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 That's so interesting. And yeah, I've seen some of your some of your painting. You do a Sunday uh, workshop with friends and people, or it's class not really or? a workshop. People just show up and do what they do. And every month we we have a group critique where people just say what they want to about each other's work. But other than that, nobody, you know, unless somebody asks me, I'll give them some suggestions. But it's not a workshop. It's mm -hmm. just people coming in and painting to have that connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Wonderful. It seems like it's such a it seems like it's such a free spirited event of people who just come and really enjoy your company. And and it, I come in there, and there's just such a nice energy every time I walk in. And it seems really cool. You you I, you you have such a nice energy, Tom. I don't know, I don't know how. I mean, you're just a nice, sweet guy. You're so with it. And you're so. I'm just so fascinated by so many things about your life. And you walked me through your house when I came over for dinner with Alan and his wife Taz the other day. And you showed me this big circle, and the circle. I I would love for you to kind of describe it to me because I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher it trying to explain what it was. But I but I believe it had something to do with like relinquishing your ego and kind of getting a stepping away from the these these parts of yourself that you're going to adapt into as you grow and as you age. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one of your own designs, kind of a theory of mm -hmm. yours um, to kind of be the best version of yourself or the best mm -hmm. creator. Um, can, can you walk me through that and kind of in, tell us what that was all about? Because it was super fascinating to me. I would love to, and thank you for bringing that up. Because yeah. I, have a, I have a deep passion that developed uh, when I was 42 years old. I was a practicing alcoholic, and I became suicidal, not because of the alcohol, but because of the thinking. Because when you're an alcoholic, the problem you have is not with the booze most people think it is, it's with your mind that isn't able to cope with reality in a, in a healthy way when you're young and so you find alcohol and then it takes away a lot of uh, those painful emotional things. So when you're drinking, you're free, uh, way freer. I used to be shy, really shy, but when I drank, I wasn't. Mm. I had liquid courage mm. Mm -hmm. and other exp experiences I had in my childhood that were not, you know, very... Uh, nurturing in my family so i just had and there's something about people who are living more in the in the right brain more people who are creative in general are they find they're more sensitive to subtle things they're very sensitive people who don't suffer well mm. and so when you put alcohol in people like me it it becomes a a, a very good friend mm -hmm. and for years it it actually i believe kept me alive wow and then it then it started turning. You know, there's a Japanese saying that first the man takes the drink, then the drink takes the drink, then the drink takes the man mm -hmm. or woman. So that was it. And I ended up uh, putting a gun in my mouth when I was 42. And I told a friend of mine who had been in AA that uh, there was maybe something that would save my life uh, that I hadn't tried yet. So he really encouraged me to go to a meeting. And I did, and that changed my life right away because I felt hope and I felt connecting and I felt love in that first meeting. Mm. Wow. So since then, I have just stayed 
on the path of uh, moving away from living in my mind as the master and moving down into the heart where where truth is, where love is, where spirit is. Call it God, call it whatever you want, source, creator of the universe, but that is all is within each of us. Mm -hmm. At 42, when I put a gun in my mouth, I didn't know any of that was, existed. And the program that I found is based on spiritual principles, and it's, it's also based on going through these simple steps to deflate the ego sufficiently enough to have a spiritual awakening. And that means that we get reconnected to our heart, to some people call it God. I call it love. Mm. I had armored my heart with my mind so much through all those years of drinking that I did not really know how to feel love anymore. So I was disconnected from the only thing, to me, the most important thing in life is to be connected to that being nature that is inside of us. Mm -hmm. And as I spent those, I you know, spent the decades being in, in uh, recovery and then reading lots of books on spirituality and going to uh, different kind of meditation retreats and all of that, I started to experience the truth that um, we are educated in a way that is backwards. Uh, we mind nap, we mind nap young people and they are then led down a path that is all about consumerism. It's all about living for the future instead of living in the mm -hmm. moment. And everything that education does is to keep them away from who they are. We ignore the truth that's inside of each of us. So that thing that you saw is, a, is five rings that I came up with to sort of describe visually how it where it started and how where we end up so in the center ring the bullseye is the being that's b two two letters b that's the truth of our of our authentic nature we are beings spiritual beings and in that state we are in a we are in perfection there is nothing that can be added or taken away there is nothing judgmental in that place it is called love and it is a high vibrational energy that science has been, you know, working with in the last few decades uh, to reveal that the heart has an amazing power of its own. It has its own brain mm. and that the heart sends 5000 percent more magnetic energy up into the mind that the mind then the mind sends down to the heart. And they can measure all this now. So the heart is way more than an organ. It is actually the seed and the, the essential nature of what makes us uh, who we are authentically. So at, you know, when I started experiencing that truth and then realized, okay, well, from the being, where do we go? Well, we go into feeling. The being nature does not feel plus or minus. The being is just, it just is. It transcends anything that comes from the personality self that is developed as we go into what Ram Das calls somebody training. And somebody training is when we learn language, when we learn how to label everything. Mm. And as soon as we start labeling things, we, we miss the things, we lose the thing. Now, as an example, uh, when you look at a chair and you're, you don't know what the hell it is as a baby, but then the parents point out this thing that you don't know what it is, and they keep saying chair, and then pretty soon you say chair, and then anything with four legs and a seat in the back becomes a chair. But you, as soon as you label it, you quit seeing it. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is you quit seeing the specificity of what it is, like the colors that it is, the texture on the chair, you know, does it have a pad, what, what kind of light is hitting the chair. So all of the things that define one chair from another chair are lost and everything becomes a symbol. Like a Christmas tree symbol that kids, you know, kids just make these silly little things that everybody right. mimics. The same thing with drawing an eye or a mouth. You put a line around something. There are no lines around our eye, there's no lines around our mouth. But why do we symbolize everything? Because we're taught to label. And that, dis that moves us away from the truth of what we see. So we go into this being mind-napped at an early age, and then we are 
pulled further and further away from our being as we are taught that doing is, is the action. You're going to go out and do stuff. What are you going to be when you grow up? All of this stuff is setting, pe- setting kids up to false beliefs that happiness is going to find its way to them out there. So it's an externally uh, created reality. Mm. It isn't even reality. It's just an, uh, something that we are taught, God, go out there and do all these things. When you have more stuff and you do more things, you'll be happy. Well, if you come back to the center bullseye where the being is, we are already happy. We are born in a state of just pure joy. It's something that I love the word ineffable. Mm. I can point to it with words, but words cannot be it. Right. So the part of us that is the true authentic self transcends language it is beyond words and thoughts and when i started teaching and i uh, 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 as i got into recovery and i started experiencing stuff i realized my god these college students are are just lost because they are being educated away from the truth and we pay only lip service to it at colleges and all the way through education really Um, and so i wanted to do something that i could uh, that would potentially have a benefit to help students see that there's another path. You know, instead of going out there and living in the having and doing those outer rings in my target, that they can start focusing coming back into the place where the heart is and let the heart be the master of the mind. But what's happening in almost everyone is the mind is the master of the heart. And if you look at what's going on politically and socially, Everything that's going on, we are falling apart. And we're falling apart because we are not addressing the most important part of what it means to be breathing on this planet. Hmm. And that is our nature. Wow. That was, uh, I want to stand up and applaud. Yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. That was re- that, so. really, really well put, Tom. Um, we do a lot of practice in um, manufacturing those outer rings, right? You, you've, you've said in that that we teach young people and we teach children wh- who you're going to be eventually. You know, we teach them to future think and to jump way out and try to figure out the world. Um, and I would agree, agree with you that the center of, of, of ourselves, our being, our heart, is the most integral part of our reality and uh, the most integral part of ourselves. How do you combat that practice of uh, cultivating those outer rings and and yet going in the heart? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what is your practice? What is your daily Mm -hmm. routine like that allows you to get outside your head and more into your heart? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question, and I started a class three years ago that addresses that specifically, and I, it's for incoming fresh people. I don't call them fresh men anymore. Okay. Uh, that it's a class is designed to help them become aware of what I'm talking about so that they can go through college and use specific practices and tools that will become habits and rituals that will start changing the uh, emphasis away from the rational mind being in control and letting the heart start to become more and more the guide for how to get through life. And there's an Einstein quote that I love, and I found it many, many years ago, and I have it up in the, in the room where I teach painting, and it, it says, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind, a faithful servant, we as a society have made the servant the master, and we have forgotten the gift. So here's one of the brilliant, most brilliant minds ever saying that the rational mind is not going to work if it's the master, that we have to, we have to reattach uh, ourselves and become connected again to that intuitive self. And he calls it the intuitive mind. But it doesn't mean mind in terms of thinking mind. It means awareness. The, the intuitiveness of us is, is at the heart of this whole, uh, p- 
that this whole purpose of living authentically means we have to trust our intuition. Our intuition came with the first breath. You know, we came with this gift of, that's a big part of creativity is our intuition. Mm. And to come back and tap into it uh, and, to, and to trust it. And then people say, you can't trust your intuition and all that. Those are people who are living in their head, buying into all the stories they've been told that, well, you better think, you got to figure it out. Uh, well, our mind is very, very limited. And about three quarters of all the thoughts we have are, science has proven are negatively biased. And, and so we think the same thoughts every day. That means we're using the past to live in the moment, so we're not really living in the moment. Mm. And we have all these old beliefs that people have put into us that are not true for us. And so if we start, so what I do in this new class is every day we start with about a 15 minute meditation and I give them different people with different, you know, different uh, processes of how to meditate. And after the meditation, then they do what's called intuitive drawing. And intuitive drawing is a way to use creativity and intuition without letting the mind interfere. So an intuitive drawing is where you just pick up something to, to make a mark on a, you know, on a piece of paper. It can be pencil, pen. Uh, I encourage them to use colors, use oil pastels or pastels or colored pencils. And I say, you're going to do this just for the sake of doing it. You don't have a plan. You don't have an agenda. You cannot use any recognizable subject matter because as soon as you put down something that your mind can label, then you create a narrative and then you're lost in your mind again because you want to tell the story about that thing. So I say, you can't have anything recognizable. What does that look like? Well, you just scribble. It's called doodling. And you just let your hand move around and you feel the pressure of the tool on your hand and the paper and you watch the marks being made and just let them go. And you don't know what's going to look like. You have no agenda. You're not going to show these to anybody. They're just done as a pure, spontaneous response to the moment. Mm -hmm. Intuitive art is about living in the moment without any plan. Mm. And it's the opposite of how they are trained to think about reality. What is more real than just picking up a color like an oil pastel that makes these beautiful colors across a paper and just letting it scribble its way across or smash it, whatever you, you know, it's like being a kid again. It's like that joyous moment where you just feel like I want to rumple the paper or I want to, I want to pound on it. I want to rub my elbow on the color. Yeah, well, That's the freedom that you give yourself. And when you do that, your ego is not involved. Right. Because when you're not going to show it to anybody, you don't care what it looks like. So all of these things keep you into a moment-to-moment -moment joyous. You, it becomes very joyous. And my experience with the students toward the end of each term, as I ask them, what are the most important things that you gain from this course, the majority of them always include intuitive drawing as being very, very, very helpful to help them free up yeah. from this control of the rational mind You're giving them permission to that's it. To, to, to to be them the, their most truest self in in their nature which is so cool which is such a gift but everybody has the ability to everybody so every single person in the world can wake up in the morning and start to intuitive draw or Absolutely. do or intuitive write or just get just move intuitively move whatever that thing is we talk about um creativity a lot on this podcast and just in general because of the nature of our careers and what we do. Uh, and Alan and I were actually having a conversation yesterday about uh, self-worth and what and where it gets wrapped up and at least for me in, in that um, so much of because creativity is so unlimited and it seems like there's always so much that we can be continuing to do and expand on and understand more of. Personally, I always want to continue to like learn and do more and grow and find more and get this mm. thing. And it, it starts to become part of my self-worth. Whereas if I'm not trying to find more of that stuff, if I'm not doing more things and it falls into your pattern of like the doing, the doing rather than just being and accepting who I am, that I, I feel like 
in order to feel value in my own life, I have to do this thing. And I wonder, just because we have you here and I like feel like you're such a, a wealth of knowledge, I kind of selfishly just want to like know <laughs> what your uh, uh, like suggestions are for somebody like me who you probably run into a lot with creatives who just run into that self-worth problem with themselves and trying to trying to always garner more stuff and, and understand more so that they can feel like they're worth Value. something. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true, but I, but I don't know how to really get away from it as much as I try. I don't know if it's an age thing or what, but... Well, my first uh, 40 years was exactly what you're describing. I, was, uh, I did not know how to uh, love myself. Mm -hmm. I was not taught to love myself. Mo very few people are, uh, especially men. You know, boys are not taught about, you know, you don't hug, you don't... That was my family in a way. Mm. You never tell people you love them. That didn't happen in my family. And I know that the friends I had as a kid back in Wyoming, that, that was not common. Uh, so I, the only way I could feel okay was if somebody told me I was okay. Right. And then I, so I'd do a drawing and somebody say, wow, well, I like your drawing. That gave me validity. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I couldn't give myself validity. I did not know how to do it because I was already disconnected from my heart. And I was living out there and then I figured out, I became a chameleon. I, I could fit into almost any kind of group, no matter what they did. The cowboys, the, the hoods when I was in high school, I, you know, build hot rods and I could be with those kind of guys. I could be with the ranchers. I mean, I just... Because I didn't have my own, I didn't have my own authenticity. Mm -hmm. I was unable to do it, and I found that because uh, I got, you know, a lot of uh, success with uh, people saying we like, I like your art, and I get into shows and all that. Then I depended upon other people giving me my sense of worth. Right. And it wasn't until I crashed and burned and realized that my ego ain't my amigo. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and that was what that was when one of the spiritual awakenings or spiritual experiences made me realize, oh, it's my ego that I have to just deflate. Mm -hmm. And as I deflate it, then the doing, why I do things, changed to something that just uh, became true for me, and I didn't need you to tell me. Right. I didn't have to fit into the art world anymore. Right. But I, I have this, I use this metaphor a lot of uh, this idea that our culture thinks we need to crash and burn before we stop texting while driving. Meaning like we need to have money before we start saving money. We need to have a, a, a heart attack before we start getting on the exercise bike. We need to, you know, do this thing before this thing happens. You need to crash and burn before you changed mm -hmm. your life up do does is that necessary it seems like it's this cultural imprint that we have that just like we're we're stuck inside of that we're like i'm not going to make any big changes for myself i'm not going to i'm not going to get out of this headspace of myself i'm not going to feel value for myself with myself until i have this gigantic revelation but what is why why and how do i just eat like softly kind of land there for myself rather than having to crash and burn because you crashed and burned is from, from what I'm hearing. Yep. Um, and, and that seems to be like the, the way that so many people have this awakening for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want that to be the case for so many people because it's like, you don't, I don't want people to feel like they have to crash and burn to, 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 to discover who they are. Um, and I'm, and I'm trying my best. I feel like I've crashed and burned and I've had several rock bottom moments in my life I don't want to have another one to have to figure out who I'm, I'm trying to be. Um, mm -hmm. So do you have any, any um, suggestions for people who are potentially trying to figure that out with themselves? And because there's so many young people nowadays that are just grasping for identity and trying to figure themselves out. And I just don't think that they have to have that moment of, of uh, rock bottom to discover mm -hmm. the thing that they're looking for. Yeah, I agree with you. That class that I'm telling you about is about uh, helping people who have not hit rock bottom because they're young, you know, they're end of their teenage years. And all people go through some trauma. Everybody gets some trauma by the time you're out of your teens. 
but in most cases it isn't severe. It's not, it's not a big, huge bottom, mm. but they're, they're experiencing lots of stress. They're experiencing anxiety and, um, they, most students have a doubt, you know, that, but it, it's not profound. So this class is designed to help those students who uh, have not hit bottom, but to give them the tools so that, and to make it real clear to them that they got a, a, the biggest choice that I see they're going to make is to is just continue letting rational thought and the mind and education take them away from their self or to just do the practices that will start reversing that now so that they will they will have the habits and the rituals that will put them more in connection with their heart more often and then they will feel the benefits of authentic living uh, you know while they're in college and that will avoid them having to go through some you know horrific sort of you know event or whatever mm -hmm. does that answer your question yeah yeah it does it's not easy. No. <laughs> it's not. And it's... there are people uh, like Ram Das, who is one of my favorite uh, authors, who who brought Eastern religion over to this country back in the 60s. And he didn't hit any giant bottoms that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, some people do, uh, like Eckhart Tolle, who wrote The Power of Now mm -hmm. and A New Earth, yeah. two, of the, two incredibly important books for people who want to yeah. change the path and go on this different journey uh he hit a bottom mm -hmm. but but a lot of people that i've you know listened to and researched they just sort of slowly evolved it's a gradual awakening because they were curious and because they somehow i think they intuitively knew that living from the external world as the source of happiness was not going to work for them Mm -hmm. So maybe some people just have a greater awareness earlier on. I didn't. It's funny because uh, I discovered, well, I guess first and foremost, rock bottom, right, is subjective. Subjective, right. right. Like putting a gun in your mouth is, that's, collectively people would say that's a pretty solid, that's a pretty solid bottom. Uh, but Julian's rock bottom versus my rock bottom versus your rock bottom, that's all circumstantial and circumstantial but i uh you mentioned eckhart toll and the power of now mm -hmm. and um, my incredible wife introduced me to the power of now at what i would have called a rock bottom for me it wasn't you know in hindsight when i think about your rock bottom or uh, other um, obstacles that people have hit on the way down Mine was pretty pretty easy, but it's incomparable, dude. Like, it is it, it is incomparable, but I just I got to make that known to the internet that I'm not complaining. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ah, well, you're allowed to um, too. But that book that book changed my life. That book really uh, gave me a perspective. I would encourage anybody. Period. Like regardless of where you're at in your life, mm -hmm. give that give that book and that author Eckhart Tolle some time because. The perspective is really cool. I, I go back like constantly and will listen to The Power of Now. I'm not much of a reader, but I'll listen to it on audiobook. And uh, I wanted to ask you, though, Tom, because I feel like I'm a creative person and I'm right brain, but I'm also like a slave to my rational mind quite, quite often. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, what tools, if any, would you would you use to know how to balance those two things? Because I personally believe that, I mean, my rational brain, I appreciate. Mm -hmm. I've never heard that quote before by Albert Einstein. The mm -hmm. intuitive brain is the master and the mm -hmm. rational brain is the servant. Which is cool to think about because it doesn't, it doesn't disrespect the rational brain, because I think we need that in some capacity, Absolutely. right? But I don't know when to shut my rational brain off mm -hmm. and turn on the intuitive brain. Or are they both engines that simultaneously need to work together in your perspective? 
Well, for, I just speak from my experience. And uh, a few years ago, I went to a, a, a seminar put on by an institution called Heart Math. Yes. H e a r t m a t h. That's one word. They've been researching the heart as something beyond being an organ since the early 90s. And they have a term called heart coherence. And during that five-day uh, seminar thing, we were taught some exercises that uh, when you put your hand over your heart, as soon as you touch your hand to your chest where your heart is, your awareness goes to that place. So that's one way that you instantly start slowing the mind down uh, and as you and they have you breathe through your chest put your hand on your heart breathe through your imagine that you're breathing through your chest into you directly into your heart and as you do that think about something that you appreciate or something that you're grateful for and to me those are synonymous <laughs> uh, and as you do that you're breath and your heart become coherent and as they become coherent then the mind starts to align itself with what's going on in the heart the heart slows down then the mind slows down and the mind becomes you become clearer in how you become aware of your thoughts so it's it's a, kind of a form of meditation but it's very very powerful that can be, we can do this any time during the day to just pause, put our hand on our heart, or I put both hands on my heart often, and, and just remember to uh, breathe deep and that uh, the power, the authentic power that is in us is not in the mind, it's in the heart. Hmm. And that when we are quieting down, as soon as you follow your breath, you're not thinking. Anytime you're really truly with a breath, you are not thinking. So I do more of that now because I want my mind to be the servant and use it as a, as a great tool. As you said, it's a great tool. It's wonderful. Uh, but it is a horrible master. Mm -hmm. And to know that we can reverse that. Uh, to me, is is incredibly important to know and to be aware of. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. I'm I'm doing it right now, and I've been getting uh, getting into breath work a lot mm -hmm. in the last couple of years because I kept losing my voice on the road, mm -hmm. and uh, I there's nothing more there's nothing more shameful than having hundreds of people show up to hear you do the one thing <laughs> that you do well and not be able to do it. It's especially if they pay for it. It's very, v I've, I've lost many nights of sleep because I couldn't sing. And I started doing, uh, some breath work. This, uh, I think he's German, this cat named Wim Hof. Mm -hmm. yep. And, um, it's funny enough, I was telling a story the other day, uh, Tom, and I'm not sure that you would remember this, but maybe you might. I installed this cold plunge shower outside of my house. Uh, got a hot tub. I go from the hot tub, and then I go and whoosh, cold plunge. And This is kind of Wim Hof's mm -hmm. theory. He does, I don't know if he really works on the hot much, but he definitely does the cold plunge with breath work. And uh, one morning... Um, I'm out there doing my breathing in the hot tub, and I get out, and I go to do the cold plunge, and I look over the fence, and there's three four-point bucks in your yard. Do you remember this? I do. I'm ass naked. <laughs> <laughs> I look across, and I see the bucks, and I see you standing in your, in your window of your house, and we both, we both <laughs> go, what the fuck? <laughs> These bucks walk out of your yard and just start walking down. I mean, to see that many bucks together, that That's big crazy. of bucks is quite crazy. And I do remember this was early on living in my house. I don't even know if we were that close of friends at that point, but I remember coming inside and being like, well, I flashed, I flashed our neighbor Tom. <laughs> 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 
but I saw three bucks. <laughs> it was it was super cool. But you were buck naked. I was yeah. buck naked for the bucks. Yeah, it was a uh, shining shining achievement in my neighborly ways. But that breath work has done multitudes for me. I've yet I have not lost my voice on the road. I've been I've had a hundred and four fevers on the road and still sang through it. Wow. And it's all been from that hot, cold plunge and that breath work. And I would, I, is it James Nestor? Do you guys know this book, Breath? Mm-hmm. That's, is, uh, is that the name of the author? I don't know. Taz is reading it right now. Taz is reading Nestor it right now, but him. he um, he's done quite an incredible uh, job researching breath and, and actually breathing through the nose. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you say, put your hand over your heart. I'm going to start doing that when I'm doing the Wim Hof. Mm-hmm. That's gonna be nice. Got Julian into it too. Yeah, it's great. I I'm an, I'm anxious always, and it's been nice to uh, to find ways to to breathe into stuff. Like it, a lot of the things you're talking about kind of correlate to um, like acting classes that I've taken before because you get into these rooms and you know you sit with yourself and you really try to tap into your own spiritual essence and hold your heart and breathe into yourself and you know try to find you know, these qualities of yourself that you wouldn't be otherwise. And so have you ever done any acting or no, d- when I heard you say that it's, it's really similar. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like they, they have a lot of correlations. Yeah. And, um, it's, I think it saves me from the, the anxiety that I will have otherwise, but that goes back to the same thing of how I don't need to do that thing in order to, feel saved by that thing. Like, I just want to be able to sit still and not do anything. Like if everything got taken away, if I didn't have a podcast with my best friend, Alan, and we didn't have all of these cool tools to take advantage of. And if I didn't have like a resume of acting credits and you remove all of that from my life, I sit with myself and I ask, are you satisfied with who you are without any of that stuff? And I don't know how to answer that question for myself yet. Mm. And that is a, that's shameful to me because I want to be able to say strongly, yes, for mm. sure I'd be happy with who I am. And I know that like so many of my peers and my friends and family are, would, would say, absolutely, like you don't need any, none of that stuff is why we appreciate you or like you, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but so much of it for myself is why I like myself, and and it's just it's just it's just too bad because I really want to be able to continue to I, I have to remember, and that's why I think like acting, being creative for me saves me in in allowing me to kind of uh, uh, just relinquish the the anxiety and the stresses in my life and 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 tap into a different part of my brain that I don't tap into otherwise. And it's not necessarily that I'm like, I'm not even that much of a rational minded person. Like I'm more intuitive, I think than, than, than most. And I think I'm operating from that place almost too much sometimes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but I just haven't found out my balance with it all yet. And so, and I'm, and I'm constantly trying and I'm navigating it as much as best as I can. But the, 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 the breath work that you've taught me and helped me with the approach has, has really helped. And, and all the creative stuff that I try to do and, and, and continue with is, is really helpful, but I don't want to have to do any of it to feel good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, sorry, I, I'm not sure if there was a question for Tom in there. No, but I didn't. I was just talking. I, uh, I forget who it, who it was that said it, but we kind of pictured this destination, right? That's future thought is we have this idea about destination and end and goal and uh, we think about our spirituality and our centeredness in that perspective. I'm going to get there someday. I'm going to achieve this nirvana. And uh, I don't think that first and foremost, if you ever do achieve nirvana, it's not just going to, you're not just there forever. This is like a constant gear that you have to turn manually on your own and it's not like you're never going to deal with anxiety ever again i mean uh i'm the same way i'm relatively a a, an anxious person and in order for me to uh, 
in order for me to outsmart those demons, it's a daily practice. It's a hourly practice. And um, I think you can get closer for sure. But then, man, shit, something comes into your life and puts you five steps back. And you got to remember those things and constantly remind, remind yourself of that. Same. How often do you remind yourself, Tom? Are you just on? Are you just on this, like Nirvana autopilot now? <laughs> uh, there are very few people that, from my experience and everything I've read, uh, that have what are called radical awakenings. And a radical awakening is one of those people that their ego just disappears. Eckhart Tolle, I believe, is one of those people, and another woman that I I went on a fairly long. Uh, retreat with her and a bunch of people. Uh, Byron Katie is a phenomenal person to research about what we're talking about. Uh, and it all comes down to uh, the mind has about 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. A lot of them are gonna slip by and pull our consciousness into them. And a lot of the thoughts, about three quarters of them, are not positive or nurturing or loving thoughts. So that's where our anxiety and our stress are going to come from. We are not aware enough to observe the thoughts as they come up quick enough to say that thought is not helping me and let it pass by. You know, push it away, just move it aside. So there's a, one thing I read not too long ago, and this, this guy had studied a lot of ancient readings and years and years of research into uh, religions from the East way back. And all of this came down for him with two sentences of four, four words each. The first sentence is, was that thought useful? Four words. And the second one is, how did it behave? Was that thought useful? How does it behave? Is a way to stop all of these thoughts that want to take us away from being at peace and connected to the now. So just to come up with something like those and then memorize them and make them habitual so that throughout the day when I start, uh, the only way that I know uh, this is working though is that I have to have experience enough quietness in my body and be aware that my body can be non-stressed so that when it starts getting stressed, I am now aware that my body mm. is acting up in a way that is caused by thinking and that, you know, nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And when I first saw that, I didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was bullshit. But then as I did an inner inquiry into it, I realized that's so true for me. If I think it's bad, I'm going to believe it's bad. But if I don't think it's bad, if I just think, if I just accept it for what it is, if everything is just what it is, and I don't judge it, then I am in a space where I'm not going to react, and I'm not going to put myself under stress or anxiety. Those two things I know for me are absolutely not essentially part of life, that they are created by thinking. All emotional suffering is caused by attachment of mind. And man, did my mind attach to a hell of a lot of negative thoughts and I caused myself so much of those unhealthy feelings for years. And then another one that Ram Dass said that whenever his mind takes him into the past with something negative or into the future with something negative, he is doing violence to his moment. Mm. Mm. And man, did I do a lot of violence to my moments. Same. But my, one of my you know, missions now for me is to keep practicing awareness so that my, the witness part of me, the consciousness that is beyond my thinking mind, can observe the thoughts and choose which thoughts I am going to allow to create the feelings that I want. Research shows that every thought that we have releases chemicals into the body. 
So if all of those thoughts that are negative go in there, pretty soon I'm feeling anxious. I'm, it creates stress hormones. Uh, and the, the, God, the research is just showing so much stuff that can help us. You know, to realize that stress is optional. We just, students come into college mm -hmm. now, they just think, oh, I'm stressed about this. Mm -hmm. See, it's like they just assume it's natural and they, mm -hmm. can't, they can't get rid of it. And my experience is that that's not true. That when you start observing the, the mind, the thoughts more and more, then you free yourself from how they can trap you into negativity. Yeah. In, in practicing mindfulness, have you watched as the years have uh, evolved, as you've kind of grown into yourself and into your mindfulness that you seemingly have a lot of, um, has your art changed with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see it. You can see the evolution. Well, once I decided, once I realized that I was giving my, uh, giving the art world too much control over the kind of art that I made, that I, I felt the need to fit into what the art world was looking for. And I made a decision back in the late 70s to forego that what they care what they, uh, their thoughts about my work and I started doing public art public art you have to give up your ego because you're doing something that is more for the masses and it's not for a small group of people that would understand something that's more idiosyncratic and convoluted like where my mind likes to go but in public art you got to do something that fits a broader audience and so the art world is not going to find that interesting. They're going to say you sell, you sold out. Mm. And I realized that I didn't care anymore about the art world liking my work or not. You know, mm. their opinion of me is none of my business, and that freed me up tremendously. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, how liberating was that? Yeah, we take a break. I can be. Yeah, yeah, of course, man. Go yeah, for no it. Yeah, no problem. Go for it. What a what a treat, man. What a cool session to have with with him. It's such a wealth of cool stuff, insight. Yeah, yeah and so prevalent to yeah, like, I mean, totally, and man. all that stuff is like so touching to I think how like you two function versus how I function too. Just thinking about yeah. like you guys, your rational thought is always validation through I'm doing something so I'm succeeding. Totally. You, and and you, I need more of that but I'm way more self-aware about what I'm doing in the moment of what I'm doing. Uh -huh. It doesn't need to be achieving, but I need more of trying to achieve. Do you stay, do you stay uh, satisfied with yourself like in that place? But where that's the like, problem cool, though, is good? that yes, but that yeah. conventionally isn't perceived as productive. Sure. Yeah, well, it's, it's slave it doesn't master. matter. It doesn't matter what it's perceived as by anybody besides yourself. Yeah, but it does though, society wise. But for, like if you're ha if you're satisfied, then then what difference does it make? Like, right? Well, because you function in a, a machine that yeah. doesn't function that way. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, you just sit on sit on down in that same spot, Tom, and we'll get right back to it. We can feel better. Yeah, I sometimes am holding Those ginseng in. drinks, yeah. baby, those yeah, are good to right you. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ginseng make you sing. Um, Steve had a, a pretty interesting question. Steve, would you kind of phrase that for Tom, uh, that same question, or maybe I could? Yeah, you can, you can paraphrase. So the the idea of the intuitive mind and the rational mind, um, your self-worth should come from your being, your heart, your, your perspective of yourself, not wrapped up in achievements or monetary uh, stature. Um, but yet we have to operate, we're born into this, society and culture and we need to survive mm -hmm. we're, we're born into a monetary structure that requires us to make money and pay rent and keep the lights on and i mean unless you're a, a total wild man 
Ted Kaczynski and you can survive in a shed with, you know, some kerosene, <laughs> then you, you, you got to go and you got to achieve and you got to allow that rational mind to run wild a little bit every so often. Uh, how do you, how, I think it comes back to maybe that original question is like, how do you balance those appropriately? Like my rational mind takes over mm -hmm. my intuitive mind because I am so enveloped, especially at this point in my life in figuring out a way to make sure my family's set up. Mm -hmm. And even though my intuitive mind and heart, I think still is activated. I, I do go off that um, perspective quite often, but figuring out the, the world around me and positioning myself specifically to have a, you know, wealth of funds in my bank account to have a retirement, to be able mm -hmm. to try, you know, all these things. Um, it's, it's tough for me to like, what, what if it's the other way around? What if it is you, you have a you have an immense feeling of self-worth, but you kind of find yourself still like, man, I wish, you know, I, what am I going to do when I'm 65 if I don't really get this engine going and get things organized in the right specific way? Like, how do you know that? Is there, is there a way to get one or the other engine moving in the appropriate way or manner uh, a little easier than, than you said? Like, how did you, once you found this in perspective and enlightenment of, okay, I... I'm not going to find my self-worth in achievement anymore. I'm going to create art from my center. Mm -hmm. What was that relationship with just making a living? How did that, did that change at but all? That's your perspective on the word achievement also. Right. And also too, like, yeah, where did you, where did you find that self-worth? Oh, where I didn't need others to tell me I was... I had value that my yeah yeah you just already intrinsically had value but then like if you already if you feel like you have value then how do you find your way through the system this capitalist system that we have sort of inherited and achieve and pay your rent on time and set yourself up for success in the future yeah that's a great question uh, so a couple things come to my mind one is uh, back, oh God, decades ago, I read a book by Joseph Campbell, who who wrote The Power of Myth and some other great, great books. And he's the one that came up with the phrase, follow your bliss. And he had a little book called An Open Life in which he described that. And he, he just said, if you follow your bliss, you will have bliss. Now, this is different than making, you know, a a good living out there doing something you don't like doing. Right. And he said, if you don't follow your bliss, you will never have bliss. So you can go out there and seek all this external stuff, which is what most people do, because they have been mind napped to believe that that's the only way to happiness. Uh, and so they never have bliss. And statistics are really bad in terms of how many people like what they do. I think it's the last thing I remember was somewhere around 85% of the people don't like the jobs they have. Man, that's not a lot of people following their bliss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you might have all the trappings, and that's what people still believe is the answer. Uh, but, mm. but you're not happy. because. Mm -hmm. So is it better to follow your bliss and not have uh, all the stuff, all the big bank accounts and all that, uh, and still survive? Or to have all that stuff and be unhappy mm -hmm. and never feel satisfied inside. I mean, that's a... Mm. I followed my bliss and I didn't really know until I read that. And then I thought, man, I'd been following my bliss. I just yeah. figured out when yeah. I was young that I liked art and I went to an art school. And I just, I didn't know what I was going to make a living. Uh, I just kept doing what I loved. And the passion, uh, in my case, 
took me down a wonderful path, right? You know, in terms of career and all of that. It uh, seems um, it seems really cyclical in that your 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 heart has been motivated by the thing that you wanted to do. It wasn't like and Alan, you and I have had conversations about this before, even on this podcast, where you know our rational minds are are chasing this this thing this this dollar amount this uh, accomplishment this whatever the thing is that we're trying to get um but the intuitive mind doesn't even recognize a lot of the things that we're doing and i think like the thing that you're going to end up with at 65 is are these like memories of your intuitive self playing with rudy when you when you were now when you were living and you're like the dollar amount when you're 65 that you had when you were 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 is, ne is, is never going to be one of those things that you're clocking at like the end of your life. You're not going to be like, man, I sure as shit had a lot of yeah. money in my bank account. I'm so awesome because of that. Yeah, well, I mean, if I'm, I'm on it, my rational mind's probably taking over here. So maybe I'll have to Great. Be That's beat awesome. it back with my intuitive stick. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think there is um, a legitimate argument that would – Tommy never had kids. Am no. I right? No. Um, I look at my own life and my – and the people around me who have uh, – I think we kind of live in this world of contrast, right? So how I am able to define myself and like learn is by contrasting myself and yeah, other I just want things. To say it's trying to monetize our bliss. Exactly. Like I think you're. I don't know if that choice necessarily is that you were talking about. Is it better to have all these monetary things and security and safety, but no bliss, or is it better to have bliss and none of those things? And obviously, bliss, right? But can you have both? Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe that's where I, uh, you know, my, my perspective of my own personal uh, outlook, it, it's tough to quantify because I've never been you or I've never been Tom. I don't know how to jump outside of the way I look at the world, but I do see um, the lives of... Uh, different people uh, it's tough without like naming specific names um, there's people in my life that I've seen who have gone a certain way and done a certain thing and been happy but their happiness to me personally could be quantifiable because if there's not a lot of time left right because if you don't work your tail off when you're my age then you're going to be working your tail off when you're in your later years and uh, I'm hoping that my reality will be one that I can pull back eventually and spend more time with my grandkids and kids and um, revving up that rational mind a little bit when I'm younger mm -hmm. so that I can maybe rev up the bliss mind when I'm older. Seems like a good trade-off, I guess. And that's probably why I get so locked into the rational mind. And I would agree with you, Jules. I'm not going to remember like, dude, you remember that one deal I got, you know, that had me set up with a couple extra commas in my bank account. I'm probably not going to remember that. I'm going to remember Rudy's first pitch. If I get to be there, how do I get to be there? My rational mind. So that's like the battle I go through well, with I constantly mean, is that in order for me to cultivate ways that I have the amount of time in order to create those blissful memories, I kind of have to turn up that rational mind a little bit. How do I angle this bliss that I've created? I'm doing the same thing. I've followed my heart and followed the bliss. If I were to look back on it and like my older self to my younger self, I'd be like, I don't know. And my rational mind might take over and like poke and prod a little bit. But I've followed my bliss and I've gotten to a place where uh, I'm very happy and very excited about the life that I lead. But... Um, uh, I th I think that uh, 
I think that I'm going on a tangent that doesn't really have well, much of a point. Completely. <laughs> correct, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct, correct, Self-care <laughs> after the podcast, Cor- Alan. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> hey, Julian gets to do it every episode, man. I, <laughs> about damn uh, time. <laughs> what do I get to do every episode? Self-care. Self-care, dude. That's the best. Um, yeah, Alan, I mean, it's it's like, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it sounds like from where, like, if I'm reducing what you just said, you are doing that thing where you are, you need the thing to get the thing. You like X needs to happen. What is it called? Uh, cause, cause and effect. Mm-hmm. Like you need to have a career, a big blasting growing career in order to like be at a place in your life where you assume that you can go and watch your son throw out his first pitch like because but you don't you like you where, whereas here let's hear this out like you go and you see your son's first pitch because that is the actual approach that you're trying to take and that first pitch actually gives you feeds your soul this thing that then lends itself to the art and the stuff that you're doing outside of that. And then that whole cycle of events makes you a better artist all over, uh, all together and happier and sad, more sad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the analogy of Rudy's first pitch isn't necessarily the, the greatest pivot point in that argument. But uh, I do, I guess my point is, is that there are, th- there is something in the future that I look towards that I go, man, I, I, I better do my best to position myself now to get to that place. And it's not completely derailing my bliss mind or like my joy right now. It's more so just, I, I think, deviating a little bit. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to specifically I guess, explain it. I but guess there's, there's just no, there's no place that you get to. Is there? Or is there like a place? Like, have you gotten to where you expected yourself to get to? Or did you like have that goal and then get there and, or does it just like continue to evolve for you and always Mm -hmm. because like you're going to chase something that will never exist. And I will too. I'm not, I'm I'm not just sitting here and like arguing with you. I'm talking to myself as well, but I just, I don't think that by constantly and, and I want, we're, we're both, we have great work ethic and we work really hard and we do really cool things and that, and that does feed us bliss in a lot of really cool ways, but it also generates a lot of, uh, anxiety and it, and it creates expectations for us to continue to go and go and go. And so I think there's some things for me personally that I'm missing out on in life because I'm so focused on mm-hmm. becoming better than what I am now. Rather than just being happy with what I am now and mm-hmm. and and enjoying the fact that I'm just sitting, like, I, take the mic away, take the cameras away, everything, and we're just talking to you, and that is the greatest gift of all: is that this moment exists, mm-hmm. and that the future doesn't, and 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 it only exists as a result of how we're existing in this moment, um, and. Yeah, I don't know. It's it. I'd I'd love to sit down with like an Eckhart or a Ram Dass because you, you know, got one. Yeah, we're pretty. Close. We do. We're pretty close. <laughs> we're nearby it, but I mean, you know, Eckhart Tolle wrote these incredible books, and I would imagine that he benefited greatly off of their sales, mm-hmm. and that is in theory future thought, like to pair with a publisher and think about your message getting out like there has to be a level of rationality involved in any form of that yeah is it just balancing the yin and the yang and yeah, like think, taking doing the best part of both of those sides and that's like I the think, focus on being that's the productive aspect of it is choosing in that journey of the good and the bad as you want to just label them or whatever, but finding bliss in your end result makes your choices going through that, the positive in the end game, regardless if it was good or bad. Well, my, my experience is that bliss is not about the end game. Bliss is about the moment. 
and when we're following our bliss, we, we know we have a passion for something, and we, that's when we trust our intuition to follow that nudge. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. The nudge is to just follow something that we really just love and that we can't imagine not doing it. Mm -hmm. And so that's doing, in a, in a very positive way, <clears throat> the, to me, the balance is if, if we come from the heart, if we come from, there's a thing that says, follow your heart, uh, your brain is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so if, if we are going through the day and we are practicing the things that keep us centered in the heart, then what we do through the day has a state of awareness behind it. Mm -hmm. So we are consciously aware of the mm -hmm. things that we're doing to pursue, to pursue the goals that are perfectly fine in terms of creating this stability and things that you're talking about. But we don't have to, we're either gonna just let the mind continue to control and then suffer all suffering is caused by attachment of mind, or we're going to drop into the heart space more often and feel that sense of being centered and that beautiful bliss of connecting to mm -hmm. something, the ineffable. And then that gives us more focus and even more available energy throughout the day that would be wasted because anxiety and stress mm -hmm. pull away it takes a lot of energy to go through that. Mm -hmm. So why not practice every day the routine of being connected mm -hmm. to that, to love and to our um, essence, and then just let that be the underlying tone right. for the day. And then what we go out and do uh, is going to be done for the right reasons mm -hmm. and without, without feeling some kind of heavy, oh, I got to do this. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to bring up one word that I tell my students to get out of their vocabulary, and that's have to. You know, we don't have to do anything. And I tell them, they say, what? They'll say, I have to get to this next class, and it's like a negative, right? Uh, and I say, well, you don't have to go to that class. Just don't go. <laughs> Did you have to get up this morning? And they say, well, yeah, I had to get up. I say, well, who put a gun to your head? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got up because... You got up. Now, if you say, I have to get up, you are putting a negative bias on that, mm. and it's setting the day up negatively. But if you say, I get to get up, I get to go to school, I get to go to this class, because it all is get to. Life it is not better. have to. It's get to. Yeah. Mm. And when I mm -hmm. figured that out years ago, it's so freeing to wow. just get that word out of the, out of the way. You know, these words have so much power. Uh. Uh, so I say, forget about that word. And every time they use it, I just say, no, 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 you get to, you mm. get to. And then they start realizing that there's a big freedom to go through the day feeling lighter. It's like, oh, God, I, God, I have to go do this. Wow. It's not true. It's never true. Mm -hmm. It's such a simple thing. It's so simple, but it's... one word can just be debilitating. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's, it's not even the word, right? It's the perspective. It's the, I mean, the word is very, very powerful, right? But mm -hmm. just, you could feel like you have to, or you could feel like you get to. Mm -hmm. And that feeling, we attach these words to these feelings, right? Like, it's we just do. a mouth, have is just a mouth sound. Yeah. But it's how we feel and how closely centered we are to our heart that we can change that perspective. We're so much, such powerful be beings. And that's like just been such a thrill to have you in here, Tom, and uh, get to get to dialogue with you about it. I feel like we barely even talked about your art. You just gave us a dissertation about <laughs> centeredness, which was <laughs> being a human. epic. Dude. Oh, yeah. the best. Thank I you, can't Tom. thank you enough, Tom. And we, I, I just want to ask uh, a favor of you if you'd come back eventually and, and we can talk more. I would love it. I would love it. I love being here with you guys because it's, this is being. Yeah. You know, this like doing, to me, it's focusing on what's here right now and this conversation uh, definitely benefits me. Yeah, uh, it very much so benefited us too, Tom. Yeah, find yeah. Out more about you guys, and you know. I think I think it's 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 a really cool 
plat this is a becoming more of a popular thing to do in the in the world of entertainment and uh it's been such a cool approach for us to take as creatives because it really does allow us to to be present and to and to kind of just like get get settled in and and to find our flow and sometimes it's hard you know like interviewing people or talking and trying to like talk and make sense with each other like our friendship is growing through this steve's friendship and ours is growing with this like we're it's an interesting thing but at the end of the day it's like what you were just talking about like the the simpler you allow yourself to be with it and the more permission you allow yourself mm -hmm. to have with just like being and existing mm -hmm. the I'll best just, comes let me just say one thing the, to me it comes down to the one word connecting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that when we connect we feel a part of life on a much deeper level. Mm. That's why the coronavirus has caused so much suffering because people <clears throat> are really looking into faces and seeing each other and feeling that energy coming out of us that connects us. Well, we thank you for connecting with us today, mm. Tom. This has been so great. this has been rad. It's man. been amazing. Yeah. I feel like I'm floating. Yeah. I feel like I am too. I'm gonna in, <laughs> I'm gonna invite you over to Alan's house myself for dinner. <laughs> Will you come over? Okay. Don't, well. would you go. Oh, you don't. Don't we owe Tom a dinner? Yeah. yeah spam, we owe you maybe. Several. Yes, yes yeah. you do. Spam. Two, two or three. Yeah, let's We're have spam. a spam. Uh, let's see what's We're up. We're gonna get some masubi going tonight, baby. I also want to hear the spam song again. Yeah. One more time. Can you yeah. can, can you talk us off? Hand it out with the. Should we give you the background? Should we give you the bum bum bum? Oh yeah. Do it. I'm so alone. I don't have a spam can to call my own. That spatial pink meat with jelly all over. I have to handle it and smell that odor, Mr. Spam Man. Tom Askman. He is the man. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom. You're the best, dude. You're so good. <laughs> oh, Boo Boo, did you just make it to the end of the video? Yes, you did. Do you want to see more videos just like this one, huh? Do you? Well, then head over to patreon.com slash live at the lodge where you can support the how goods of this podcast as well as the entire live at the lodge family. Yep, yeah, you're going to get exclusive merch, personalized shout out videos. Me and Jules, we're going to show up at your house and baptize your nephew, huh? Check it out, patreon.com slash live at the lodge. lodge.